Welcome to the fourth episode in a legendary series about ancient Ireland. In part four, St. Patrick, we will talk about the life of the Christian evangelist said to have brought his faith to Ireland. The five kings of the so-called five provinces of Ireland grew fabulously rich by raiding Roman Britannia during the imperial twilight. Incessant and often brutal raids against the West British coast by Irish pirates helped to break Roman power in the region. By the 420s, Irish raiders grew so bold that they sailed up the Severn River, seizing huge amounts of grain, cattle, and people as they went. Most of these young men and women simply vanished into the slave markets, never to be heard from again. Yet one man proved to be very much the exception to that awful rule. That would be St. Patrick, the man widely credited with bringing Christianity to Ireland. Born the Roman Patricius in 401 AD within modern-day Wales, he fell victim to an Irish raiding party who sold him into slavery at the age of 16. He caught his first glimpse of Ireland through the planks of a pirate ship's hold. Upon returning home, the Irish pirate sold Patricius to a chieftain where he worked as a shepherd in the rugged hills around his master's home. The Roman youth found himself living among a pagan people who drank ale from horns and carried out animal sacrifices to his horn. Despite being a captive, he grew to love Irish music and storytelling. Nonetheless, six years later, Patricius stole away from his captors and walked across the length of the island before making his way to Roman Gaul. Patrick's mission began years after the legions left Britannia, at a time when the British church began to move away from faraway Rome. Another bishop had traveled to Ireland to bring the Gospels around the year 431, but he left after staying only a year because of his disgust at his lack of success. Indeed, most Christian bishops would have regarded a mission to Ireland as exile, far beyond the map's edge, but Patrick had called this terra incognita home. While we know more about Patrick's life before his return to Ireland, his days afterwards have become shrouded in legend. According to Irish lore, Patrick returned to Ireland during the Feast of Light when men extinguished all fires across the island. No flame would be lit until the king's druids lit a beacon at the Hill of Tara. When he arrived, Patricius lit a beacon of his own, making a direct challenge to Ireland's druids. Such men led the worship of the Celtic gods for as many as 20,000 years, the time of Stonehenge, and often did so in fenced-off sacred groves. In times of dire need, they also presided over human sacrifice. Men well-versed in spellcraft, medicine, and religion, they served not only as religious leaders, but often political leaders. Undaunted by the ancient and powerful order, Patrick traveled throughout the island, drawing people allured by his simple message of love and brotherhood. St. Patrick especially focused on converting chiefs, as that could often mean the conversion of an entire village. The legends about Patrick are legion. They include his using shamrocks to explain the trinity, and the shamrock was already important to the Irish, for the druids used the three-leafed crest to make love potions. Another legend tells of him driving snakes from Ireland, though this is unlikely since snakes never actually dwelled in Ireland, and this was likely a metaphor for his driving paganism out of the island. Regardless of whether he exiled the snakes or not, St. Patrick devoted the rest of his life to spreading the Gospels. After his death in 460 AD, the Irish church revered him as their founding father. 
Yet St. Patrick alone did not bring Christianity to the fringes of Roman Britannia. The parents of Iltud the Knight, Christianized Romans who also lived in Wales, hoped their son would become a Roman soldier. Instead, he chose to defend Christianity as a monk. St. Iltud became venerated as the founder of what would become the first school of divinity in Britannia. Hortudus. At its height, Hortudus boasted a thousand pupils and schooled many saints and evangelists of the age. Some say that St. Patrick himself attended Hortudus. Monasticism became a mass movement across South Wales, Ireland, and northern Gaul, with monks often living in timber huts and churches surrounded by palisades. Monks soon followed St. Patrick to Ireland after receiving the blessing of the king. Those who went unannounced risked becoming martyrs. After establishing communities, these immigrant monks preached the gospel. As the monasteries grew stronger and more prestigious, local kings often wanted a relation of theirs in the monastery. Many of these royal monks later became saints to better flatter the monastery's patrons. Since abbots often came from prestigious families, they attended royal banquets and helped to elect kings. Unsurprisingly, these abbots lived more like princes. Instead of waking up early to say the morning mass, they commanded vast resources and numbers of people. When kings went to war, monks and abbots sometimes joined the armies of kings bearing swords and wearing armor. In some cases, one monastery went to war with another monastery. After all, there was a lot to gain. Irish monasteries became home to merchants, soldiers, prostitutes, and peasant farmers who worked their lands. Some became the centers of communities with a population as great as 3,000 people, a tremendous number for early medieval Europe. Irish monasteries became renowned across the continent for producing gold, silver, and copper jewelry, along with intricate devotional objects and reliquaries studded with diamonds and sapphires mined from Ireland. Indeed, the great wealth commanded by the abbots inspired deep resentment among the peasants who tilled their land. About 60% of the Irish did not live past the age of 35. The poor subsisted on vegetable mash and black bread. The latter often came with unprocessed pieces of grain that left the peasants with broken teeth. Any man who survived past the age of 35 often had nothing left of their teeth except stumps worn down to the gums. On top of that, peasants might be drummed into the service of their resident king or abbot for a border conflict. Unsurprisingly, the abbot's misuse of their power sometimes led the peasants to rebel against the monks, just as they rebelled against their princes when they misused their power. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.